Uthi, and I am the communications coordinator for the locally led project and SDACD. Um, a little bit about me really. Am I unmuted? Okay. Yep. Okay, sounds good. All right, so um, so though we live in the digital age and print media maybe isn't as prominent and, and, and used as much anymore, but it's it still is incredibly important part of the marketing mix. You know, in print media, um, it can help your organization extend its exposure, um, reach potential clients that you might not be able to reach. Some people, not everyone uses digital. So print is still a good tool to use. Um, you can gain exposure with it, engage in your target audiences um, with certain campaigns, and it's still a very credible source of marketing. Um, so the different types of marketing we can use, the different materials are business cards, of course, brochures, rat cards, flyers, and posters. Uh, postcards, newsletters, labels and stickers, door hangers. I mean, it goes on. There's so many different print resources that you can utilize and to reach different people and to spread your message in a certain way. I mean, you could even do fridge magnets if you wanted to, table tents at restaurants. I mean, it kind of just depends on what your message is. Um, so first thing we're gonna talk about today is business cards. And so I'm sure many of you have business cards, but if you don't, I highly recommend you get some. They are incredible. They represent um, your company of, at a first glance and first impressions are super important. And it's essential to make that first impression really rememberable. Um, so business cards, they convey important personal information such as your name, your job title, your email, your website, your address and phone number. But oftentimes it is also the first exposure um, to the overall image of your um, business. And the fonts used, the text, the paper stock, and uh, also convey a message about um, the type of industry you're representing. So image is everything. So having a business card on hand gives the appearance of professionalism and shows that you're ready to go. And also with business cards, um, they're quicker than passing digital. I mean, when you have to get your phone out and bring out an app, you know, so someone can type in their contact information, it's just easier to slip them the business card. But again, always have some on hand. You never know <laughs> when you're going to need to give that out or when you're going to need to promote your business. So if you don't have any, I highly recommend you uh, get some. So some tips when you are designing a business card. Um, so business cards are about uh, 3.5 by two inch, standard little small piece of paper. Um, and when it comes to business cards, I always recommend using colors that match your brand. And so if you're a conservation district, our colors are usually green and blue. So um, with that business card, use those maybe different shades of green and blue or keep them the same as your logo. That way it uh, shows like your brand identity and it helps people put a like an image to your whole brand. Um, for better impact, use back and front. Um, usually one side would be your contact information, um, who you are. Uh, and then the back page can be a place where you can put in your services and describe uh, maybe a slogan to, or just what you can help with and why you're beneficial. But it's important to utilize most if you wanna get the best um, impression. Um, when it comes to business cards too, I usually prefer to do like one to three fonts. They uh, work tremendously. And, uh, but uh, I usually stick with sans serif fonts, which is um, cleaner look. Um, again, with the business card, you only want to use the most relevant information. So that is your logo, your name, your job title, phone, email, and uh, contact, any contact information, um, and then your services. And then also another thing is to consider um, a call to action, whether that be um, including a QR code to your website or maybe your tree order form even possibly as well. 
um, and add social media icons to let people know like where you, uh, that you have social media and that they can follow you. Next, we'll talk about brochures. Brochures um, are great tools to utilize. I can't say this enough. They are um, incredible to use because they let people know about your services and your goods, what you're all about. And it allows you to have a more in-depth conversation with people and really get to the point of what you are promoting and what you want to promote. Um, so with brochures, it's important to have inform uh, important information and interesting information to include but also um, backing that up with visuals and maybe including infographics. Um, they are perfect for trade shows, events, meetings, and walk-ins. Um, they're great to have with you uh, for those kind of things. So uh, some design tips when it comes to brochures. Um, brochures, the standard size is about 8.5 by um, 11 inch. So a standard piece of paper is what you're gonna wanna do. Fold it in two or Fold it just in three, usually is how you do it. Um, when it comes to brochures, I usually limit it to about four um, colors. And uh, these colors you want to use consistently throughout the brochure. But one thing to note is you want to keep it with your brand. So I tend to stick with green and blue when it comes to conservation districts and things like that because it allows us to continue our brand identity and uh, be able to help people identify like what our business is all about and what services we provide. And uh, yeah, but uh, also you wanna break up paragraphs with uh, bullet points or spacing, get adding some spaces in there. Um, make brochures easy to skim with headers and subheaders and bold those out or make them bigger so they stand out a little bit. So when people are skimming through, they can just immediately find which section they wanna read. Um, use high quality graphics or infographics. Again, they give readers a visual break and allows people's eyes to kind of wander and find, uh, oh yeah, it gives a visual break from text blocks basically. <laughs> Um, when it comes to choosing a font, um, choose an easy to read font. And so I've provided some examples of ones that you should have in your programs. Um, Times are for Serif, there's Times New Roman, Garamond, Palatino are good fonts to use. And then for Sans Serif, Arial, Tahoma, and Verdana are good ones. Um, when it comes to fonts, though, I want to also say like I tend to use Sans Serif the most. For me, sans serif shows that things are casual, they're modern, but also sans serif is a lot easier to read than serif. And serif is good to use as well. Um, they're actually really good to use for headers. Um, so then that sans serif can be the one that you use for long bodies of text. Uh, serif shows that you're professional and it's more formal. And that's kind of why I like to use sans serif because it's more casual modern laid back kind of a feel to it but yeah those uh, fonts listed are some great ones to use um, highly recommend thinking about that with your next uh, brochure or any uh, print material that you use um, another one is rack cards these are great because they convey information at a glance and you'll normally see these and have seen these at visitor centers or right when you walk into a restaurant you'll see all those that stack of cards there that promoting Wild Water West and the Black Hills and all that stuff. Well, this is another uh, print material that we could use ourselves to uh, promote our services, whether that be for tree planting or expressing why we're needed, why conservation is so important, or even just giving tips about certain uh, things. Um, so you can use rack cards to promote meetings or events. Um, you're hosting your services, helpful links, um, feature any projects you're working on. They're great for so many things. Um, but with rack cards, you're gonna wanna use some very high quality visuals and colors because you want that attention to be fast. Um, also include your benefits, features, incentives, a call to action, whether that maybe be using a QR code or just call now, list your number, big and bold, and always include you, any contact information in your logo. Rack cards are another good one for trade shows, events, and walk-ins. 
Um, not much for rack cards on design tips. They're basically the same as a brochure, but just condensed. So, but rack cards are usually sized at four by nine inch. Um, when you're doing a rack card, use the maximum amount of color you can. Again, to be more consistent with your brand, I tend to use like brighter shades of green and blue if it were to come to designing any rack cards. Um, and photographs, add photographs, infographics, make it appealing to the eye. Um, focus on the visual. Um, again, color, photos. <laughs> And then put your call to action on top because the way we read things is we always start at the top and then go down. So whatever you want to convey, whatever message, put it right at the top. Um, next, we'll talk about flyers. Everyone knows about flyers, has probably used them quite a bit. Um, these are great to promote your services, your, um, if you have any special offers, events, and more. Um, when it comes to flyers, you're going to want to include a clear and enticing message and design that grabs customers' attention. Um, these are great to distribute um, direct to mail. You can send them through the mail, do them door to door, um, put them in newspapers, but you'll probably want to condense that down to maybe an ad. And that's something you'll have to talk with your local newspaper about. Um, hand out at events, of course use them at trade shows, bring them and put them on the bulletin boards of restaurants, gas stations, and schools even, depending on what it is you are promoting with the flyer. And then have some laying around at your office, put it in the window of the door before they come in. Um, but flyers are so great because you can use them really anywhere. And they are such a good space to use to promote anything. That you're having. Um, flyers tend to be about the standard paper size again, um, but you can always switch that up. But that standard size of 8.5 by 11 is great. Um, so when it comes to flyers, you're going to want to be creative with your fonts and don't use any more than three. Otherwise, it kind of just gets too crazy. And so I tend to use sans serif fonts like Arial, Tahoma, and Verdana. When it comes to flyers, because it's easier to read and it really, again, keeps it casual. Um, when it comes to flyers, you're also going to want to use visuals. That can be images, that can be graphics, but whatever it is, make sure it's something that conveys your message or what you're promoting. Um, when it comes to long information, break it up some way by adding some space or put some bullet points there. Um, think about where the viewer's eye will bounce around when they look at a um, at the flyer. And usually we start, of course, to read things from left to right. So I usually put the most important information or something that's going to grab the attention on the left side of the flyer. And then the right side would be more about the information to back up whatever it is you're um, talking about on the left. Um, Another thing, with any of these materials, take a break and come back. I can't tell you how many times I've been staring at something that I've been de designing for a few hours, you know, and your eyes get used to staring at something. Walked away for a little bit and then came back and <laughs> noticed some mistakes that have been made. So if you're working on some, take a break, come back, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to catch any mistakes and also let people proofread. Another big one, always let people proofread. Um, so next is postcards. Postcards gets your message into the right hands. Um, it's great because it quickly conveys any key messages that you have and it offers um, right up to your prospects or customers, right? It makes a high impact and gets right to the point. That's what makes them so great because people don't really like to read maybe all that much. So postcards are like the way to go with that. Um, they're great tools to pair with different marketing activities. So say if you're going to be making some emails or some calls to people, postcards could be a great way to be like, hey, I'm going to be calling you. I'm going to be sending you this email. Be on the lookout for it. Or if you uh, have an event, it could be a follow up like, thanks for coming. Hope to see you again soon. And if you have a survey, postcards are great to utilize with um, sending those out, whether that be including a QR code or a link to where they can take the survey. Um, when to use postcards, uh, they're good for event invites. They are service promotions, outreach for potential CIS projects. We've been using postcards um, for that quite a bit these past few months. Uh, Follow-ups, 
to any events that you had, or again, if you want to promote surveys, you can use it for that as well. The postcards, their standard size is 4.25 by 5.5 inch. So they're a little small, but uh, they're, they're cheap. That's what makes postcards also great to use is they don't, they're cost effective. So postcards, we use striking imagery, imagery and graphics for it. Keep your text short, simple, to the point. Whatever the most prominent information is, make sure that is easily legible to read. With uh, postcards, you're gonna wanna use white space. Otherwise, it gets to look too cluttered. So keep stuff spacious. Don't want it to clutter too much. Otherwise, it gets to be too much. Um, another thing is consider increasing your postcard size. So again, usually use about that four, four by five around that area. Um, but if you really want to grab attention, a six by nine, which would be a lot bigger, would be the way to go. But again, it's, uh, it's going to cost you probably a little bit more. But if you do it in-house, again, it's going to cost you a little bit more as well because you can't put uh, multiple on the same sheet of paper. So it kind of gets to be a lot. But if you really want to grab attention, that's the one to go with. Um, Lastly, we're going to talk about newsletters really quick. Um, if you don't have a newsletter, I highly recommend you get one. These are great because it gets your name and your face and everything you're about out into the public. And it keeps your name in front of people. It um, helps build uh, regular communications with your customers and prospects. You can build um, relationships with customers through regular communication with high value information. It allows you to show off your expertise. And it's a great way to let people know all about you, what your services are, how you've been helping the community these, this past year, this past week, or depending on how much you uh, send out a newsletter. You could send it out yearly, monthly, weekly even, but even just yearly would be great just to let people know what you've been up to and why you're so essential to the community. Um, you could send newsletters out physically or send emails to people, whichever way. Uh, it's just a trial and error thing when it comes to that, because some people like to get it physically. Some people like to read newsletters online. Um, so it's something you'd have to play with. But with newsletters, so newslet newsletters like sizes, they vary a lot. I mean, the standard size usually is like a regular piece of paper, but you could fold it up and make a like a mini booklet for your newsletter. It just depends. Um, but when it comes to newsletters, you're going to always want to at the top of the page on that first page um, is include your logo, the newsletter's name, the date, and the volume in the issue of that newsletter. It gives it a more professional feel and uh, lets people know that this isn't the first one. You're going to keep sending them. <laughs> and, um, You'll want to include table of contents. Uh, make sure that it stands out, but it doesn't have to be um, doesn't have to take up a lot of room. That lets people know like what's inside the issue and where they can find specific articles that they want to read about. Um, include a call box, an area that lists your staff, your board, who you are, what you do, maybe your mission statement as well. Um, and then on the, every page, you're going to want to have a running head, and that can be put up at the top. Or at the bottom of the newsletter, and that uh, basically can, uh, shows like what the uh, newsletter name is. It includes page number, volume, issue. It keeps consistency and professionalism throughout the whole newsletter. And then, of course, the body. It's the meat of the newsletter. It's organized by columns, headlines, layouts, subheads. But the most important thing about any of that and with the layout is to remain consistent because otherwise it just, if you don't remain consistent throughout with the layout, it can look a little cheesy and weird and like, you're kind of like, okay, <laughs> trying to figure out how it looks and stuff. Um, use big headlines to grab attention, especially if there's any specific articles that you were talking about, make it big. You stick to three to four fonts and I usually stick with that sans serif font because it's easier to read, especially if you have long bodies of text. You'll want to stick with that uh, sans serif font. Use photos and graphics freely. Keep it visual. Keep it interesting. And if you have any important points or maybe quotes or anything, 
maybe stick those out as well on the side, have a sidebar with that quote or that visual or include infographics. If you are using a lot, of, if you have a lot of statistics or graphs that uh, you're mentioning in your article, infographics are great, great to use. All right, so um, now you will, a couple things we'll talk about here is make your print uh, material a little bit more act interactive. So QR codes are great because they're a great way to draw attention to your web page or your website. And um, you learn more about your products and services. They're just an easier way to convey that. And they're easy to use and can be customized to fit your needs and your company branding. And so the website that I provided there is a free website there where you just have to have the link and then you just insert it in and they will uh, develop and create a QR code for you. It takes seconds. It's great. I use it all the time for when people need to use QR codes or want to use QR codes with their materials. Um, infographics, infographs, infographics, statistics, and graphs can be dull but formatting them as an infographic allows you to reach your target audience in a visually appealing and memorable way. Um, include a digital copy of your infographics online. You can use those for social media, you know, keep it visual. And it keeps people's attention a lot more with that. And it makes things interesting and spices up any text that you may have. And then lastly, social media. And, and on any of your print materials, I highly recommend you include your social media icons and um, tags um, in your printed material um, to take the conversation online. Post engaging contact, content online enforces, reinforces your printed material. It's a great way to keep a campaign going through all avenues and shows people um, all the ways that you're kind of flowing in your material and stuff. But always include that if you have it, if you can, um, yeah. So what colors should I use? This is so cool. I love this chart. It's so cool to look at and see how colors convey and how um, there's such a psychology behind it. But again, so with conservation districts and our industry in general, green is basically the color we use for most because it's the easiest color humans can identify with, actually. Um, the color green is the... Um, color that our eyes can discern the most shades of. So it, that's why green is the international color of relaxation, nature, and peace. It's a universally associated with environmental things. So it's great for conservation related materials. That's why I use green for pretty much any everything for our things. Um, but just changing the shade is what I do. Blue is another favorite color for marketers and brands um, all over the world. It's the color of calm, uh, control, logic, honesty, intelligence, security, purity. I mean, it goes on. Um, it's soothing tones help establish trust-based relations. And that's why a lot of social media use, uses blue. It's because it's so, it conveys security and intelligence. Um, but we also use blue because water, <laughs> water and air and sky. So it's another way to convey that message as well. But yeah, consider if you're ever designing anything, think about your message and how you want it to come across. Um, using yellow, if you really want to grab attention, especially with like rack cards, for example, using yellow can really like uh, grab attention. And so, yeah. Um, this website that I included is a website I use quite a bit when it comes to picking out shades of colors that I want to use for different materials. It's, uh, it allows you to combine and check out what other colors would look good and it finds colors that would look good with certain uh, colors that you want to choose. But it's a great resource to use when you're developing your own materials. Um, Okay, and then lastly, what I'll mention is Microsoft Publisher. Um, if you have Microsoft Office Suite, then you have Microsoft Publisher. Almost anything you need designed, whether it be flyers, posters, postcards, newsletters, business cards, and more can be done in this program. Um, it comes with hundreds, hundreds of pre-made layouts and templates that you can use for guidance, for ideas, and inspiration. So, um, 
if you would ever want uh, to learn more or would like a tutorial on how to work with publisher, please let me know. Um, I could help you uh, do a tutorial or maybe create a video that goes into more depth of how to use publisher and how to access any of those pre-made layouts and templates. Um, I think, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I'm gonna plug myself in a little bit here, do a little plug. Um, if you have any materials that you would like design, whether that be postcards for potential CIS projects, or maybe you have some old pamphlets or brochures that you'd like updated and like redesigned, or if you'd like some infographics made for certain articles or for social media, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to help with that. Um, and especially with anything, uh, <laughs> Anything that you have, I mean, I love graphic design. It's one of my passions and I would love to help out in any way that I can. So thank you. If you have any questions, please put them out right now. Um, do we have any? I can't see the screen, but. Yeah, we had one. Um, okay. we, we guess we have a few coming in here. Um, okay. Can you touch it. on how you keep this information accessible to everyone. Like for example, um, I've noticed a lot of social media using descriptors for the visually impaired under photo captions. Have you done much with the accessibility side? With the accessibility side, personally for me, no, I haven't. Um, especially when it comes to social media, that is something that's a feature on there, I guess. I haven't really, yeah, I haven't really done anything with that, but that'd be something that I personally would love to look into though, to do a little okay. bit more research about it, especially when it comes to print materials, it'd be very um, good to have for that. So thank you. I'm going to make a note of that. <laughs> cool. We've got a few notes on a tutorial on publisher. So that's something we can look into. Okay. Um, and Yvette, was wondering what is the best item to use to spread the word that customers will keep and not toss in the trash or get lost in the mail pile the silver That's... bullet <laughs> <laughs> well it's so tough i mean again i think the best thing it really depends on what it is you're trying to promote what i would normally use would probably be like it, it kind of just depends it's all about trial and error um Firstly, I would try out a postcard and maybe, especially um, I would try out that six by nine size, make it big, make it informative because you're gonna wanna display what information is the most important. And so that could be that and it's quick, it's not long. So people don't have to read much into it. People don't like to read much. Our attention spans are kind of shot. <laughs> so we like our information to be quick easy, accessible, and get right to the point. And postcards can do that. And postcards can bring attention and they're cost effective. They won't cost as much. You can do it easily in house or you can outsource it. But uh, I think postcard, I think I would do a postcard. Would be my go-to first, first thing. And pair okay. that with social media too. Yeah. Anything you do, always pair it with that, always. Yep, as, as, and as Katie mentioned, we've been doing quite a bit of work with, with postcards and kind of just seeing what's getting more and more traction. So trial and error, like she said. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we can definitely work with you too on, um, well, I say we, Katie, um, can definitely <laughs> um, help and kind of explain some of the different things that we've tried. Um, yeah. Otherwise, is there... Any other questions? And see, we have one more here. Um, okay. Michelle, we will we will reach out to you <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me to help get a postcard started. Um, awesome. Sure. <laughs> yeah. No. Nope, would love it. So we Sorry, will. Sorry, I'm excited now. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we will do that. Okay, sweet. Ooh, Yvette also had a quick question. What are your thoughts on swag? <laughs> swag is great if you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, any swag would be great. I mean, any of any materials to send out 
shirts, t-shirts, t-shirts are big, magnets. I, I, always, I don't know why I always think of magnets for swag for some reason. I think it's because they're always such a hit and any marketing thing I've been at, people always go crazy about pens and magnets. It's crazy. I don't know why, but I'm in the same boat where I see a pen, I'll pick it up. <laughs> Do I need it? No, but I'll pick it up. And uh, magnets, same thing. I, it's some things to consider uh, potentially if you want to keep like putting your face out there would be using some materials like that, especially like if you have like a table tent at a restaurant, like having those at restaurants is a great way to spread because people go sit down you know, they kind of get bored, maybe talking to each other, they'll look around and having that right there on the table would be great. It's, there's so many different things you could do. Door hangers too. If it's tree season, you're like, hey, we've got trees in, come on down. Put those on some doors of people. It just, yeah, there's so many things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm rambling. No, that's, it's all good. It's good info. Okay. Um, so I guess before we we'll move on to Stan here, if there are any other questions, um, let us know, or if you have something else that, that pops up, um, feel free to type away and we will, we will get to it. Um, so with that, thank you, Katie. Uh, lots of information in there. Um, we will have these up again, um, these recordings up online. So we will, and we'll also, um, send out links to these or uh, these presentations too, so you can have them on hand. Um, and with that, we have Stan Wise from the Soil Health Coalition, who's going to talk about social media. Um, and he's also got some information on um, newspaper and, and print materials also. Um, so we will let Stan get going. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stan Wise and uh, I'm the communications coordinator for the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition. I'm also, our, I used to be uh, the editor for the Farm Forum. Uh, I've got just a few tips and practices um, for you to follow with social media and maybe uh, in your communications with your <clears throat> local journalists. Uh, certainly can't follow <laughs> uh, as good a presentation as Katie's there, but I'll do my best. Um, so first of all, why should you use social media? And the reason is that younger audiences consume uh, much less traditional media. They're not watching TV, they're not looking at newspapers, they're getting their news online and primarily through social media. Um, so that's, you wanna be where they are. And it offers a great way to uh, make the exchange of information interactive. So they're not just, you're not just talking at them, they can, ask questions and respond um, <clears throat> to what you put out there. Um, and sharing your information on social media makes it easier for your audience to share that information with their own social circle, circles. They can just click the share button and share your information with all, <clears throat> with all of their friends. And also building a social media following builds your reputation as a, pro a provider of trusted information. And you've seen that, I'm sure if you've been online, somebody's like, I've got 500,000 Twitter followers, people pay attention to what they say. So if you build your own audience, um, you uh, carry a, a greater reputation for providing trusted information. So which platform should you use? At the Soil Health Coalition, we use uh, Facebook groups, Facebook pages, um, Twitter and Instagram. A Facebook page is good for sharing your events, uh, your articles, your videos, your news releases, your available programs, uh, users can post their questions, and, but a good thing you can do is, you know, create event pages in Facebook and share them. A Facebook group is good for letting other people interact with you. So you can start conversations, share photos, and allow people to share their own photos, um, information about practices, what's happening in the field. Uh, it's good to encourage your audience to interact there. And some of you may be members of Facebook uh, groups already, like ag groups. I, I'm a member of one that has like 30,000 people. It's very active. And people go there for all kinds of reasons to, from here's what's happening in my field to uh, how do I fix this on my tractor? So they can be a great way to have a back and forth with the people that you're trying to reach. 
Twitter has much fewer users than Facebook, <clears throat> but the people who are there tend to be very engaged. And so it's good for sharing all types of information, links out, photos, uh, getting people engaged. cutting your legs out from under yourself. Uh, and if the article that you link doesn't have a preview image, you need to add one of your own. Um, so uh, make sure that you have permission to use any uh, photo that you, or video that you inc uh, include with your posts. And uh, also one last tip is uh, uh, be aware of how the social media platform may crop any image you share. So you might be like, all right, I'm adding this great image and it cuts a guy's face in half. Uh, so you just want to make sure you look at that preview image and edit it uh, so that it shows up better. So when you're reposting something someone else has already created, number one, you want to thoroughly vet both the creator and the content of the post. You uh, Are they reliable? And does it represent uh, the mission and vision of your organization? Does it contain offensive information or controversial topics or buzzwords? Um, this is just protecting yourself and also making sure that you don't put any inaccurate information out there because you don't want to damage your reputation as a provider of information. Also be wary of endorsing any products or favoring any company or organization, even when liking or retweeting or sharing other people's posts. Um, and if you're sharing somebody else's content, does the photo, video, or article preview photo correctly represent your organization's mission or vision? You know, I have to watch out when I'm posting for the Soil Health Coalition I might be sharing an article about soil health tips, but the preview image might be something else from the magazine or the outlet that I'm sharing. And it might be, you know, somebody out there tilling a field, a field, and that's not the image that we want to portray as Soil Health Coalition. So I might add my own photo in there uh, instead of using their preview image. Uh, best practices for your individual platforms. Facebook's uh, best times to post. Uh, I mean, six, eight, eight, 6 and 8 a.m., most people check Facebook first thing they do when they wake up. Uh, and also at the end of the day, uh, end of their workday, I should say, people are starting to check out and they'll switch over to Facebook and that's 2 to 5 p.m. When you're posting, try to keep your text to five sentences or less. Don't use hashtags on Facebook. Um, one cool thing that you can do on Facebook, though, is you can create a, if you've got a page, a Facebook page, you can create a slideshow video using up to 10 photos. So you can take those photos and add them in and it'll give you an option to <clears throat> create the, a slideshow and you can add music if you want to. And it creates a own little, your own little video uh, from those photos. So that's a cool way to tell a story about an event or something that's going on in the field. Uh, Twitter, the best time to post is one to 3 p.m. Uh, you can tag other Twitter users to boost engagement, but don't tag a billion people. <clears throat> Hashtags can increase your engagement if used correctly, but don't use more than two per post. Uh, those get shown to less people. Uh, make sure that your hashtags are spelled correctly and don't make them overly complicated. And a good way that good thing to do is to see if others are using them before you use them. And make sure your post is readable. If you've got a bunch of hashtags and you're tagging other people in there, it can get to be a little difficult to read. Instagram, the best times to post are between 11 a, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So people are on it, you know, during the lunch hours, and then they're on it right before bedtime, 7 to 9 p.m. <clears throat> it's photo based, uh, so make sure the image contains all the information that you want to convey. Uh, not a ton of people read the uh, descriptions of your photos, and also in the description you can't link out to another website. But one thing that it is really cool to do with Instagram stories that we've had some success with is, is using the, um, the stories feature on Instagram. And I'll show you kind of an example of that. Uh, but uh, you can use it to drive traffic to another Instagram post or a product page. Um, you can engage with your audience by letting them ask you anything on the stories post, or you can uh, conduct a poll that way. So it gives you a way to make Instagram a little bit more interactive. And I'll, I'll show you how we use it in just a minute. 
So here's some example posts that we've uh, done recently with the Soil Health Coalition. Um, this first post is from uh, Twitter and it is just three images, you know? And the reason we posted that was that nothing more than to engage our audience, to get them thinking about soil health, of course, uh, and what's coming up in the year, but also we wanted to build engagement. We wanted them to share it. We wanted to uh, share it and we wanted to get more followers because of it. It's a good way to build your brand just by sharing photos of what's happening right now and getting them thinking about, you know, for us, getting them thinking about how they can use soil health, even if they don't have a big farm or um, just as they're planting their garden in the backyard. Uh, so it accomplishes multiple purposes at once. <clears throat> the next post, uh, next post is from Facebook. And this is one that I wanted to point out to you is this image is both fantastic in one sense and really bad in another. Like this is bad photography. This is really bad photography, but it is a slide that was shared by Jimmy Emmons in our Soil Health Conference. And it is fantastic in the story that it conveys. Um, right, you know, you see the water infiltration on uh, the left side, on the field on the left side of the road, and you know, the water runoff on the right side of the road from the same rainfall event. I mean, that tells you a ton about soil health practices. Um, it violates all the rules that I know about <laughs> photography, but yet it gets tons of engagement and people really respond to it. So this is to, I, I wanted to share this with you that you don't have to have the best photo as long as you're sharing something interesting. Uh, and I sort of violated the rules about them, how much text to put in front of this uh, photo because I wanted to let people know what was happening uh, in this photo. So this is, I kind of broke the rules there a little bit. Uh, and Instagram, here's another example. We got a lot of engagement on this uh, photo over to the uh, to the left there. That's a photo one of our staff members took uh, of bale grazing. Not a great photo from photog photography standpoint, but producers and people in the ag world can see this tells a story about what bale grazing is and how you set it up. Uh, and I did include more information here for people who do read the description to find out what exactly is going on in this photo and how to uh, and how they might do something similar. And over here on the right is an exa example of one of our Instagram stories. What we did this year was we set up uh, a different Instagram story category for each of our research plots. And then as we visited the plots throughout the summer, we would take photos and we could give you kind of an update on how that plot is going uh, throughout the year. So all you gotta do is go to our Instagram page and click on one of our plots and you'll see a, a succession of uh, photos, almost kind of like a, a slideshow um, that'll show you how that plot progressed over the course of the summer. So if you've got a story that's taking place over time, an Instagram story is a great way to share it. Photo tips. All right, have the post that you're going to make in mind before taking your photos. Know what you want to convey. And then you want to shoot at least three different photos from three different angles so that you're sure you've got the photos that you need to accurately portray your story. And unless you're shooting for Instagram, hold your phone or your camera sideways, horizontally. You don't uh, want to use vertical photos unless you're shooting for Instagram, which has a more uh, vertical aspect ratio. But uh, Facebook and Twitter all have a horizontal aspect ratio. Uh, and this especially goes when shooting videos, always, always, always for videos, shoot horizontally. <clears throat> so the perfect photo is less important than shooting something interesting. If it's interesting to you, it will likely be interesting to your audience. Um, field activities, you know, visual comparisons, soil tests, livestock management, whatever you're doing in, uh, in the field, you know, your audience is probably doing, and they're going to be interested in that. Uh, Shoot high resolution photos and don't degrade your quality by texting them. On your phone, make sure your photos are taking the highest resolution possible. And when you, let's say you're not the one going to be posting it or sharing that image to social media or others, don't text it to the person who is. Use an email or a cloud sharing service to send them a photo because texting degrades the resolution. And that's not quite as important, though it sometimes can be for social media. It is big, it's big time important. if. People want to use that image in print. Uh, 
Also, unless you're shooting a group of five or more people, make sure you can identify the people appearing in the photo. Uh, and don't use the zoom feature on your phone when shooting, just get closer. And don't be afraid to shoot and share short video clips. Under a minute long, those do really well. Uh, you know, from the seat of the tractor, from or you're uh, doing a test in the field, people are going to be interested in, in how that works. So the keys to success with social media are to be consistent, uh, decide how many posts you intend to post every day, and then stick to that schedule. The so uh, Soil Health Co Coalition, we try to post once a day. Uh, and we stick to that. That includes weekends, uh, holidays. We set it all up to go once a day. Uh, be engaged. That means monitor your social media feeds. Don't just uh, forget about it. So if someone asks a question, uh, respond as soon as possible, even as to tell them that you're tracking down their information. And if you don't have the information they request, find it. Uh, and if somebody posts something offensive to your channel or platform, you need to remove it. If you're if you're not engaged, they're not going. To. Uh, you need to build your audience, uh, and that means posting items like photos and videos and interesting articles uh, to grow the number of people who are watching your content uh, and keep them engaged so that more people will see your posts about, you know, your upcoming event or your press release or your new program that you're trying to promote. And then uh, make your life easier. Most of your social media platforms have tools that let you schedule your posts in advance, uh, but we also, we use a third-party tool called Hootsuite. And there, there are a lot of others uh, that allow you to schedule all of your social media from one platform. And, you know, I can schedule um, posts days in, in advance so that I'm not having to worry about it over the weekend or over a holiday. Um, that's all the stuff I have on social media. I'm going to move over to traditional media. If you're, This is if you're wanting to submit content to your local newspaper or radio station or TV station uh, to have them send that out to their audiences because not all of the people you want to reach are uh, young and on social media. But the number one thing you've got to remember is that media outlets have far fewer resources than they used to. They have been hammered by social media. Fewer people are using them and their ad dollars uh, have gone down and they have far fewer journalists, they have far fewer producers, editors who have the time to devote to getting your information in front of their audience. So you wanna, that's the number one thing you wanna keep in mind is that they don't have many resources, so you wanna make it as easy for them as possible. So the basics, the first thing you wanna do is build a relationship. So introduce yourself to your local media before you ever need them to publish something. Um, invite them to social media, to social events, uh, but whatever you do, don't give them gifts or pay for their food or drinks that violates the rules of journalism and ethics. Um, but it's harder, as a, even as a journalist, there's still people, as an editor, you're still a person, and so it's harder to say no to someone you know. So let them get to know you, and they'll take your phone calls, and they'll make your content a priority. Uh, make it easy to say yes. So you want to submit your content in a way that makes it easy for them to use with as little work as possible. Remember, they have very few resources. Uh, make it easy to read. If you want them to simply reprint something that you've already written, which is a huge bonus for you and it's easy for them just make sure it isn't boring because if it's boring they're going to say no i'm going to lose an audience's attention with this and they're not going to do it so whatever you're putting out there write it like an article not like a news release uh, and then make it news if you're hoping for something more than just like a here's an uh, upcoming event an announcement frame your content in a way that makes it clear that it is new interesting and something that people should care about all right so making it easy to say yes First thing you got to do is use correct grammar. And as Katie said, you want to let somebody proofread you uh, on your po on your articles and things that you're sending out there. Uh, but this includes spelling your names correctly. Don't capitalize words just because you think they're important. So ag education is important, but it's not capitalized because those are two common nouns. So only capitalize titles and proper nouns. Avoid the ampersand symbol. These are just some quick tips. Um, we like to use the word utilize a lot in a news release. That That's like you know, fing uh, fingernails on a chalkboard for an editor and just use the one syllable word use. Uh, learn the basics of AP style for abbreviation, job titles, when they're capitalized and when they're not. Uh, make sure it's accurate. This is a big one. Double check your facts, dates, times, phone numbers, email addresses, web addresses, uh, whatever it is before submitting your content. I can tell you I hated nothing more than uh, relaying 
information that was provided to me in the news release only to have readers uh, call me up and say, hey, that's not right. And then I have to publish a retraction. Uh, that's, a, that's a real good way to make the editor look sideways at you the next time uh, you, you submit information for them. Uh, when you submit information, make sure they can copy and paste it. Every editor, whether it's in uh, radio or TV or newspaper, has their own editorial system, and they've got to copy and paste your content into it. And PDFs and flyers are really, really bad for this. For whatever reason, PDFs do really weird things with text. It gets rid of uh, word wrapping. It just really makes it a lot of work when, uh, for somebody to try to put it into their editorial system. So. Uh, even those really cool documents that Katie showed us, those aren't what you send to the press um, because it's really hard for them to copy the information out of it. Uh, it's better to put your text in the body of an email so they can quickly, cop uh, quickly copy and paste it into their editorial system and edit it. And whatever you do, don't send it in a Word document and especially avoid sending photos in a Word document. And the reason for this is, is that you, it's almost impossible to get high resolution photos out of a Word document. Uh, send your images as attachments or provide links for downloading if they're too big to email. Uh, more on photos, make sure that you have permission from the copyright of the folder, uh, from the photo to send it out for publication. Uh, otherwise, if they print somebody else's photo that you didn't have permission to uh, share, you've exposed them to liability because they just violated that person's copyright. Um, usually the person who took the photo is the copyright holder unless they took the photo in the course of their work for their employer. In that case, the employer owns the copyright. Include a caption and a photo credit with every photo you send. That's a huge headache um, for any outlet to get this photo and they don't know what's being portrayed. Uh, if there are people in the photo, you need to identify them in the caption unless it's a big crowd of people. Uh, some outlets have policies that require any pictured person to be identified, and this will save it, will save them from having to call you. Uh, send high resolution photos, and I've been talking about this. Uh, the reason for that is, is that screen resolution is 72 DPI, but print re resolution, depending on the paper or, you know, the quality of the publication that they're sending out is anywhere from uh, 160 to 300 DPI. And that, so they need higher resolution uh, photos for print. Uh, and so, and then finally, don't send uh, to the press out of focus, grainy, dark, poor quality photos. Uh, make sure your photos are crisp and sharp. Uh, don't have the little date thing in the bottom right hand corner that some cameras let you do. Uh, just send them a, a nice professional quality photo. All right, so making your content easy to read. Uh, this is a, just a quick rundown on uh, how to write it so that people will pay attention to your article. What you want to do is let them know the crux of your uh, news release in the first couple of sentences, the most important information. And this is called the inverted pyramid. Uh, it's a thing that journalists get hammered into them. But basically, the most important information goes at the top of the article, which is where you've got people's attention, who, what, when, where, how, and why. Uh, then you can narrow down the details, you know, uh, getting to important details and then the background information. This is a good way to uh, at least let somebody know what's going to be happening in your uh, article right in the beginning, and then they can keep reading for more information. Um, people's attention spans are short these days, so you at least want to make sure that uh, they get the gist of what you're trying to tell them. Another tip is to don't lead off with long organization names or obscure program names. If, if I've got an article that starts off, the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition in, in conjunction with the National Natural Resources Conservation Service and the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts and the South Dakota Department of Natural uh, Environment and Natural Resources, I've already lost a bunch of readers. So I would say uh, a new program is available for farmers who want to address salinity issues in the field. And then down farther down the pyramid, I would explain who's put it, who's putting on the program and why. Um, quotes are great; they're wonderful ways to punch up your article and make them readable. But make sure that the quotes are from the sources in their own words. If you take a bunch of committee-approved, PR-approved language and you stick it between quotes and assign it to somebody, it's gonna, it's just gonna be boring and it's gonna turn people off. 
Um, also vary your sentence length. Uh, avoid overly long sentences and give preference to shorter sentences. Uh, remember, if you're writing for the media, you're basically writing for an eighth grade uh, reading level. Um, make it news for your uh, calendar entries, event announcements, news briefs. These are little uh, news items that are less than 200 words. It doesn't have to be breaking news. You can say we've got a event pe coming up. People are invited. You know, it's going to be free or you know, uh, it's going to be at this time. That's fine. It doesn't have to be the next big thing. But otherwise, you need to know, let the media know why it's a big deal. Remember, you can't spell news without new. So if you're telling them about something new going on, a journalist is automatically, their ears picked up and say, yes, I'm interested. I want to tell the story. But if it isn't new, you need to tell them why it's still a big deal and why they should care about it. So many publications have audiences beyond agriculture, and uh, they need a reason for the city folks to care about a story. For instance, at, at the Farm Forum, we shared a newsroom with the uh, the daily Aberdeen American News, I couldn't get an article written unless I could convince the American News editor to let me use their reporter. And in order to use their reporter, I had to uh, convince them that the article that the reporter would write would be of interest to people living in town, not just out in um, the rural areas. So don't just say, we're having a field day to explain our conservation research plots. Instead say, Runoff from fields reduces water quality. However, with improved soil health, runoff can be controlled. And we're holding a field day to explain how agriculture can be part of the solution. Suddenly, you've got people in town saying, yeah, those farming guys can uh, maybe help solve climate change. And, you know, yeah, I want to know more about this. Uh, these are some miscellaneous tips. If a media outlet wants to do an interview, don't, uh, don't request the questions ahead of time. Journalists just cannot stand these canned PR approved responses. Um, let, let them get you in your own words and it'll make for a more interesting article and your read and the people you're trying to reach will be more likely to pay attention. Um, if they do interview, uh, don't ask to see and approve a story before it's published. You don't, as a source, you don't have approval rights in the stories that they publish. However, it's a really good idea to let them know at the end of the interview that they can call you at any time and verify any of the facts or quotes before they publish the story. And that's something the journalists appreciate, especially uh, there's still people that are worried about bothering you if they have to call you a second time to get something right and you don't want them to publish something wrong. Uh, if you know you want your content in a particular outlet, don't be afraid to call them the day after you send your news release and just ask them if they got it and uh, ask them if they have any questions about it because sometimes it gets buried in their inboxes because a journalist's inbox is like a fire hose. Um, if you're trying to get them to write a story uh, before you even send out the news release or call them up and say they uh, might be interested in something, have uh, the names and contact information of good sources they can call and speak to. And you, you're going to want to verify with your sources that it's okay for you to give their phone numbers and contact information to a journalist. But you want to have that done ahead of time before you call them. That makes it really easy for them just to pick up the phone and uh, get their quotes and start writing an article. Um, and don't be upset if they edit your news release before publishing it. One thing we learned in newspapers is everybody gets edited. But however, if they got any facts wrong and they published it, uh, call them up and let them know, even if it's just a misspelled name. Uh, journalists believe they're writing the first draft of history and they do not like to be wrong. So uh, if they do get something wrong, they like to know about it so that they can publish a correction to set the record straight. So if they, if they mess something up, by all means, uh, give them a call. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, you can feel free to call me if you have questions uh, about any of this, and I'll be happy uh, to do my best to help you out. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, just had one quick comment about um, seeing proofs. Um, if they've had problems with being misquoted, is it still okay to, or how would you approach that? Um, <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. And if you have been misquoted in the past, I could certainly make you less likely to want to speak to a, a journalist. Uh, so again, I would stress that they could feel free to call you and verify the quotes before they 
before they publish the article and make sure they've got all the facts straight. Um, if I had a choice, if I were in your shoes, I would try to find, if I could, as uh, diplomatically as possible to a different journalist <laughs> to, to work with. Uh, I understand completely if somebody has messed up your quotes before, but you you also want to identify whether or not that was done, if you felt like that was done maliciously or on purpose, or if it were just a just an accident, because journalists are, are people and they make mistakes too. So you're going to have to use your own judgment about how much of a second chance you're going to give them. <laughs> For sure. Um, I had a quick, I had a question on the social media side of it. Mm -hmm. Is there a platform that you've had, um, or which platform have you had most success with as far as engagements and I guess in the ag side of things? Uh, I would say it's broad. probably equal, equal amount of engagement. Uh, I, the most, we get the most engagements on our Facebook page as opposed to our Facebook group. On our Facebook page, we've we get the most information, but I would say that people on Twitter uh, tend to be very active as well. Um, so even though there's a smaller number of people engaging, they they tend to engage a little bit more. But overall total engagement, we get a higher engagement on our Facebook page. Cool. Um, we had a quick a question on um, PDF versus Word submissions. Um, my printer wants the PDF but we struggle with layout all the time. What do you suggest if we don't use either of these? Um, well, that might be a question for Katie. More than me, I'm not certain. If they're talking about submitting it to the press, I would say copy and paste the information in your PDF into the body of an email before you send it to a journalist. Uh, don't just send them the PDF or whatever else you're using. Just put it all in the body of the email and send the photos you want to send as attachments if they're you know, if they're small enough to send. So under 10 megs, keeping your whole email under 10 megabytes is a good rule of thumb. Otherwise, you can put them on some uh, cloud hosting service like Box or Dropbox and put a link in your email for them to download a higher resolution version of the photo. Okay, it was just noted here, it was for newsletter printing. Yeah, sorry, that's probably for Kate. <laughs> Yeah, with the uh, with newsletters, if your PDF and your Word isn't working, um, I'd have to think about that because that's usually the programs that I use or save them as, anyway. So, yeah, uh, give me let me think about that and I'll get back to you. Because yeah, when it comes to newsletters, I always usually save them as PDFs and print them that like that. I don't usually ever use them with the Word, Microsoft Word, and uh, I'm not entirely sure if if even like changing that to Microsoft Publisher would change it. I don't know if you have been designing your newsletter um, with any of that or where you have been designing it. I guess or having it being made so far anyway. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it didn't really answer your question, but uh, let me think about it. Okay. Yeah. We can, Yvette, we can reach out to you. Um, mm -hmm. Katie can reach out to you and see if we can help in any way. Um, perfect. Thanks, Yvette. Um, is there, I guess with that, is there any other questions before we um, wrap? up today's webinar. And just wanna thank Stan. There's a lot of really good information about traditional media in there. Mm -hmm. I know I learned a lot. Um, <laughs> it's nice to hear from the side of someone um, who has worked on that side of things. Uh, yeah, I like it better on this side. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, with that, we will, we will wrap up for today. If you, anybody else has any questions, um, after we're done, feel free to reach out, uh, to me, Katie or Stan. Um, and we will send out both presentations from today. Um, 
hopefully later today, and then a link to the recording. Um, and so you can share it with anybody that you that you think of um, and use or use at a later date. But with that, we will wrap it up. So thank you, Katie and Stan. Um, and thanks for everybody that, that joined today. Um, and next week, next Tuesday, we'll have another webinar. Um, shoot, can't remember which one we're doing next week. Oh, grant budgeting. writing. Yeah, budgeting? or grant writing. But you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, the next two following Tuesdays, we'll have, um, two more. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, thanks Stan and Katie and be on the lookout for the materials from today. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Bye everyone.